GM means great movies. Good night, honey. That's Emma. Fussy, fussy, fussy. A martini shaken but stirred. <laughs> Somebody get an ambulance! You are a beautiful man. This is a bloody great wedding, you know. Snap out of it! Ten men, what? Yes! MGM means great movies. The first film starts with the last age of the Republic, which is it's getting tired, it's old, uh, it's getting corrupt. There's the rise of the Sith, who are now becoming a force. And in the backdrop of this, you have Anakin Skywalker, a young boy who's destined to be a very significant player in bringing balance back to the force and the Republic. In the second film, we get into more of that turmoil. It's the beginning of the Clone Wars. Uh, it's uh, the, the beginning of the end of democracy in the Republic, it's sort of the beginning of the end of the Republic. Uh, and it's Anakin Skywalker uh, beginning to deal with some of his more intense emotions of uh, anger, hatred, uh, sense of loss, uh, possessiveness, jealousy, and the other things he's coping with. Uh, then we will get to the third film where he uh, is seduced to the dark side, which brings us up to films four, five, and six, where Anakin's offspring redeem him and allow him to fulfill the prophecy where he brings balance to the Force by doing away with the Sith and uh, getting rid of evil in the universe. Yeah, all right, fine, let's go. In episode two, we get to go back to Tatooine. We get to go back to the homestead, and we get to see Owen Lars and Aunt Beru 25 years earlier. I thought it would be fun to show who these people were before they existed in uh, episodes four, five, and six. I feel really honored. <laughs> I, I don't think it's hit me, really, that I'm actually playing Aunt Beru. It's quite amazing to, to step into a role that's, that already exists. I mean, um, to be able to watch what another actor has done 25 years ago. So I have episode four to watch what Phil Brown has done as Owen and uh, to try and do it service in that regard. I watched Baru's part 20 times or something just to see how she acts. When Luke wants to go off and join the Empire and fight, Owen's sort of saying, no, I don't really want that to happen and he's doing anything he can to stop to stop it but Baru sees it from Luke's side as well and sees that that's his dream as well and he really wants to do that. You must understand I need you here Luke but it's a whole nother year. Look it's only one more season. Yeah that's what she said when Biggs and Tank. Where are you going? Looks like I'm going nowhere. I have to go finish cleaning those droids. 
Oh, and he can't stay here forever. Most of his friends have gone. It means so much to him. I'll make it up to him next year. I promise. He obviously doesn't want to see Luke go and do what, what Anakin did. He's not a bad character, he's, he's a good character, I think. He's doing what he thinks is right, but he's there to oppose Luke's kind of eagerness to go off and, and be a hero. It's funny because all my friends are huge Star Wars fans and so they went pretty berserk. I think the only person more excited than me was my mum. She's a big fan. <laughs> it's proof that dreams really can come true if you try enough. Working with George, he was genuinely excited by being in a set that was a recreation of a set from episode four. We uh, shot the original homestead in London on our stages and here we're shooting our stages in Australia so we're shooting our same sets here in Australia instead of in London. The set that we're on here is basically um, the homestead kitchen from episode four or the original film and it was one of the studio sets in the first film from the Tatooine environments and initially when we heard about what the storyline might be for episode two, we had to find out what information we could actually find from uh, the archives at the ranch. Of the reference things that we had to work with on the first film, we had the drawings, the technical drawings and stills from the film, but there were very few images from the first film in terms of stills reference that we could use. And in fact, this is the only one that is left from that time. So this is the one bit of reference that we've been using to recreate this room. So we basically reproduced it as it was built in um, 1975 or 6. And the ageing and the finishing is a little bit rougher than it was in um, the time we saw it before. Basically George thinks it's not as well kept at this point as it was in, as it will be. So everything in here is still in that sort of feel of, of Tatooine technology and Tatooine utensils and Tatooine um, equipment but it's all slightly different things but the sort of the spirit is sort of still still living there this set like a lot of Tatooine sets is mainly it's about where the Skywalker family comes from and their history and I think everybody who's sort of into the Star Wars world probably feels quite in tune with the Tatooine environments and certainly on Phantom Menace I think everybody had a, a little special feeling of um, connection to when we were going back to the Tatooine environments in Tunisia. We're basically using a mixture of um, uh, location work and set building and we're doing roughly the same things as they did on episode 4 which is building uh, the Homestead Kitchen which is here and building the homestead garage which is also in the studio here and then for the other environments which are basically the courtyard of the homestead the sunken troglodyte pit and the dining room which is one of the rooms off the troglodyte actually on location in Tunisia I think in the end there's something quite spiritual about going back to to the original location for the homestead in probably in George's eyes I think it's fascinating for people to know where all this came from it was quite a buzz to be on a set that had already existed and had been recreated 20-something odd years later. Working with George, he's great. He's sort of a mixture of giving little bits of advice on how he sees his take on it. He let me do what I felt like I naturally wanted to do and then, you know, he was like, that's cool, or pull that back or, you know, throw that away a little more. As soon as I met Anthony Daniels, I think he, he said, something to me from the very first film that he did which was episode four and told me a couple of stories from that and we sort of stumbled through that scene together you know you i suppose you program for etiquette and protocol and he's like answering me back and i say shut up all right shut up and he goes shutting up sir protocol why it's my primary function sir i am well versed in all the customs can you speak Bachi? of course i can sir it's like a second language to me i'm a yeah, all right shut up i'll take this shutting up sir I suppose as much as George Lucas' Star Wars, so is Anthony Daniels, because he's been there since day one. George has always said that the whole Star Wars trilogy is told through the eyes of the robots. Do you know, the weird thing is, being here doing episode two, finally, after nearly 25 years, I'm beginning to understand how, the, how it becomes this story. In episode one, C-3PO is being put together and he has no outer coverings. In this one, we get to see his outer coverings put on, but they're all a mishmash of used parts and uh, they're steel and painted and not very attractive. You know, I see people in beautiful costumes. Amidala, fabulous. Me, I'm wearing junk. So you get to see him advance in terms of his eventual reality that we will see uh, through episode four, five, and six. And it may give people a clue 
about why 3PO has always had a silver leg, you know, he, what, how come? Everyone wants to know. It's because he's always built out of junk. C-3PO came originally out of a painting by Ralph Macquarie. All sorts of, you know, engineering work has gone in to making it possible for me to wear the, this puppet on it incredibly. It's very heavy and they made this steel, leather, rubber harness. Um, I'm indeed rehearsing right now to try and get it to walk as near to 3PO as possible and it, it's very, very difficult. Filming is always like this. Very quiet, please. Stand by for rehearsal. Yesterday, I got to make the big transition, which was weird. So many fans have said to me, well, it's not 3PO without, you know, clothes on and all that kind of thing. And I was glad that 3PO was getting dressed. It was great to be there that day when that happened. And I hope the audience get a buzz out of that. I'd like to think there'll be a little, ah, now he's back sort of thing. If we get into too much trouble, we can just leave it on because we're really going to see it go on in the close-up anyway. So there he is, all put together out of a bit of this, bit of that. One of the things I like about this script is it ties up all sorts of little ends and, and thoughts that I had, and, and certainly I'm sure the fans did, about 3PO's beginnings. We seem to be made to suffer. It's our lot in life. He is somebody who, uh, who's not had the most comfortable life. Basically, all 3PO wants is to have a quiet life and to care. He starts out as a droid, he ends up as a droid. He has a very unhappy droid life in between. What can I tell you? <laughs> it was a genuine shock for me to find out that uh, Darth Vader, Anakin Skywalker, was 3PO's father. I hope 3PO never finds out. Can you imagine? Can you think of the therapy sessions that would have to go on after that? <laughs> Three people lying on the couch. Darth Vader, I am father. <laughs> My. A lot of the issues that are in films four, five, and six become much clearer when you begin to realize uh, what's behind the issues and how things came to pass. Because there's a lot of things that really are alluded to in the, in the last three films, uh, but they don't make much sense unless you really get the gist of what happens and you really have to have seen one, two, and three in order to get it all. You get to see the universe, kind of, in the first three films. You know, you get to go to the Senate, you get to go to the center of the uh, galaxy, you get to go to these very sophisticated planets and all this kind of stuff. And you're seeing things that are very sophisticated. You're seeing very sophisticated aliens, all kinds of things that are digitally created, you know, large scope, very vast scale. And everything. So then when you get down to episode four, it's all very small. You know, everything's real tiny. There's no scope to it at all. And it's in a very small corner of the galaxy. You talk about those things, but you never ever get to see them. But of course, in this, thing you'll have already seen all those things so you know what they're talking about and you'll know when he's saying you know I'm stuck here in the far corner of the galaxy you'll know what he's talking about and you'll realize that he is stuck in a little dim corner of the universe <laughs>